Hello everybody and welcome back. So in this tutorial, what we're going to do is talk about software design. Now software design is a fundamental concept in computer science, in programming, in creating applications or projects. And it's something that I know a lot of people don't ever learn or they don't ever formally learn it. Now the purpose of this tutorial is going to be to give you a general introduction to what software design is and show you some of the tools and tricks that you can use in Python to better write and write cleaner code. So this is going to help you a ton, especially when it comes to deep Bugging and to designing programs. And I'm going to hopefully kind of engrave in your brain the way that you should be thinking about actually writing code. So this is really designed for people that have kind of moved from the beginner stages and now are now trying to jump into their own projects or trying to do some more complex things. This is the next step that you really need to master. And you're going to notice that what ends up happening as you get better and better in programming is that the coding itself is not actually very difficult, but what is very difficult is when you're working in large projects, how you actually structure, organize and write your code. So what I mean by write your code is in which method do you do it? It's not about can you get the task done? It's about how well do you get the task done? How organized is the code base? Can I jump in there and read your code and be able to modify and use it very intuitively? And that's hopefully what I'm going to start to introduce to you guys here. I know this has been a long introduction, but stick with me for another few seconds because these next parts are are important. So I've actually teamed up with Manning for this video. Now Manning Publishing has a ton of different books on their website. I'm going to pop it up here so you guys can see. And what we're going to be doing for a few pieces of content on this channel is they've actually given me access to some great books that I would like to read from their website. I'm going to be taking some small snippets from the book and some things, making some notes on them and then presenting that to you guys here. Now, if you would like to learn software design more in depth, obviously you can purchase this book. There will be an affiliate link in the description as well as a discount code. But just full disclaimer, I read the few chapters of this book beforehand. I think it's very good. I haven't read the entire thing. And uh, that's where I'm taking some of this content from. And it's kind of a reference for this video. All right. So practices of the Python pro again, link in the description. All right. So let's go ahead and get started with software design. Now, what I want to do is just introduce to you a few different pieces of code. And I want to talk about why software design is important before we get into actually learning how to really do this. So let's have a look at example one here. I just have some code that I've written already. And essentially the goal of this program is to print a list of words delimited by commas. Now delimited just means separated by, and you can see that this is the first solution that I've come up with. And there's many different ways to do this. So I have my list of words, hello, yes, goodbye, last. And then I say list of words, zero plus comma plus list of words, one plus comma plus list of words, two, so on. So looking at this, can we determine and take a second to think for yourself, what might be wrong with this piece of code? Yes, it works. It accomplishes the task. I'll show you that when I print this out, we actually do get this list separated by commas, but what could be improved? Well, looking at this, there's a few different things. So when we design code, the first thing that we want to think about is designing for flexibility. And this is a huge beginner mistake. So what happens now if I decide to add another word to my list? So let's add another hello here and I print this out. You see that this code does not change. This means we have not designed this flexibly. And when we change the problem very slightly by adding, say, another word to our list, this whole piece of code falls apart, right? It works for the initial thing that we designed it for, but it's not flexible enough to work for something else. OK, so that's one mistake with it. But what's another one? Well, the next one is what if I decide that I want to change the delimiter? So let's say that the current thing that we're going to use is commas, right? And that's what we have here. Now, what happens if I change the problem and I say, let's do this with periods? Well, now you have to go and change every single one of these commas to be a period. Now, it doesn't seem like that big of an inconvenience here, but what will happen quite often in larger projects when you do something like this and say hard code in a delimiter or hard code in some variable is this may appear many, many times in the program, especially as it gets larger. So when you now want to change, say, all of those periods or all of those commas to be something different, you need to go through and change every single aspect, which obviously is not good and is probably going to lead to a little bit of human error. And that's what we want to avoid is any potential for or when we're changing or fixing this code later to make mistakes. And here, this is a huge potential because if I forget to change one comma or one period, first of all, it's going to be difficult to find that error. But second of all, it's just a big issue, right? So let's move to example two. So that was the worst example I kind of have here, example one, and showing you that yes, this works, but this isn't a good design. This is not how we should write this. And when we think about this code, we should think about how we can design this more flexibly and scalably so that if we change the problem slightly, this still works. 
Okay, so now we're on E2, uh, and this is my solution too. So we can see that I've defined a list of words. I have a variable here called to print, and what I've done is said for i in range four. So that's the amount of things that I have in this list here. What we're gonna do is add the list to this to print, and then if i is not equal three, so if it's not the last element, we will add a comma and we'll print this out. So let's look at this. We can see that we get the same thing, but looking at this solution, what is wrong here? Well, take a second to think about it but it's kind of the same thing as the previous one. Yes, okay, so this works a little bit better for us now, but not much, right? So if we wanna change the comma, at least all we need to do now is change one thing instead of three, so that's a little bit of an improvement from beforehand. But what if about this four here, right? This again is hard coding how many elements we're gonna have in this list. So what happens when we add another element? If we go ahead and do hello here, right, we still get the same thing. So if we wanted to make this more scalable and more flexible, we'd likely change this to be the len of list of words. So that way when this changes, our solution can adapt and it can add all of those extra words. So now what's the issue here though, right? We said if I does not equal three and we hard coded that variable in, but now that we've increased the length of our words, this doesn't work anymore. We can see these commas are getting all messed up. So what we really should do is change this to be the len of the list of words minus one. And now we can see that we fixed the solution slightly. Now this one is a little bit complex. That's okay. You know, it has a few more lines of code than we really need, but this is showing how we can kind of get more flexible and redesign our program so that it works for different variations of the problem. So let's go to E3 now. Okay. So this one is a little bit better. So what we've done is we've said list of words equals, we have four words and we do comma dot join list of words. And that already is much better. So what we've done now is we said, okay, so this will work for any number of words, right? No matter how many are in there, we only have the comma one time, which means if we need to change something, we can change it right here. That's pretty easy. And if we go ahead and print this, we see that this works fine. So this is a better solution. I would mark this as, you know, acceptable. This is okay. If I saw this, I wouldn't be upset but an even better solution now moves us to E4, where what I've done is I've actually defined a delimiter constant, and now instead of having comma.join, I have delimiter.join. Now, the reason this is better is because to change this now, all I have to do is change the constant, which is denoted in all capitals, which tells me this is a constant, this is used throughout the program, and this is where I should change it, and now let's say that we change the problem even so slightly and we want to print this twice. Now, rather than putting another comma here, right? Like we would have in a different solution, we simply write delimiter again, and it will use that same delimiter from above. So this is much better. Um, what is the issue here? Oh, I have an S at the end. Okay, so let's run that. And we can see that this continues to work. So this is hopefully starting to make you think about the way in which we write code. We want to make things flexible, scalable, and we want them to be able to work well if we adapt or modify the problem, which happens quite often when we're writing large programs. We initially start out with some algorithm that does something very well, but then the problem may change or adapt. And what you really need to think about is, okay, what can I do now to make sure that if this changes in the future, my code still works, or it only needs very minor adjustments to adapt to that. And that's really what I want to start getting you guys thinking about. And that's that's why I've done this example here of example one, which again, I just called common design mistakes. Okay. So let's move to example two now and let's have a look at this. So we're going to get into some more complex examples. This is just the beginning to get the kind of wheels spinning and get you guys thinking about it. So I have this game here. This is a number guessing game, right? We have a guess up here. We have some while loop. And what we do is we essentially get the user to guess a number between zero and hundred. If they get it correct, you know, it tells them how many guesses they got it in. Otherwise it tells them if they were under or if they were over. So let's actually add some periods here just uh, to make sure this is consistent. Okay. And now let's run this. So let's look at the program down here. I actually don't know if this is going to work in my subline. So I might have to bring up a terminal window, but if I click 45, yeah, so this doesn't work in here for some reason. But let's uh, just go into a terminal window and I'll run this for you. So CD example two, Python e1.py. Okay, so please guess a number between zero and 100. Let's guess 34. It says your guess was under. Okay, let's guess 40. Your guess was under. I think the number is like 44. Uh, your guess was under 45. You guessed it in four guesses. So that's the basic game. Now, looking at this, what do you think that we could improve on or why might this code might not be optimal, right? Why may it not be optimal, especially if we wanted to say reuse this in the future? Well, I'll start listing a few things that I see immediately. If we want to change the number, right? What we need to do 
is change both instances of 45 here. So if we want to change what number we need to guess, and we know the, the number here is 45, we need to change both of these. Immediately, not optimal. This means there's room for human error. We could change one and not change the other one. We could break our program quite easily. And if I want to change this number, it's not that easy, especially if this game gets more complex for me to go through this code and find where 45 exists, right? So number one problem there is that 45 is hard coded. We shouldn't have that. We should add a constant to the top here, right? Where we do like number and then set that. Okay. Anything else? Well, what about this range? So between zero and 100. So we haven't actually really defined that like anywhere else in this code that this range needs to be set. But you know, what happens when we change our number now to be 800, this range up here now needs to change as well. So that is obviously not good. That means that now if we change this number to be anything lower than zero or higher than hundred, we also have to figure out that this is going to be a problem while we're printing and we need to change that. So immediately again, not optimal. Okay. So now what if we want to run this guessing game 500 times, but with a bunch of random numbers? Well, we aren't really able to do that without just copying and pasting this and then making all of those modifications that we made before. So this really is not an optimal solution. Yes, this works for what you needed to do. And in a smaller program where you're only going to use this once, this would be acceptable. That would be fine. But let me show you a better approach to this, which is E2. So now what I've actually done is I've taken this program and I've converted it into a class, a class that is scalable, flexible, and that will work multiple times. And this is the idea behind software design, right? When we start making things, even something like this, that's simple, we should think about the idea that we may want to use this again, and that we need to say, what's going to happen if we change this problem, right? If we change the range from, you know, zero to hundred to 400 to 700 or something like that, right? What do we need to do? We actually have to go in here and change that value. We shouldn't have to do that. We should set up what I've done here, which is a class, which will handle that change for us. And we design that at the beginning because we've thought about the problem and we've said, okay, well, we're going to need to potentially have something different. So let's design this so it's very flexible and then it doesn't work for only the specific problem we're solving right now, but it works for future problems. So let's get going to just dive through this guess number here and look what's happening. So what I've done is I've said we have a class called guess number and here in the initialization, it takes some number and then two optional parameters for the minimum and maximum range. Now notice these are optional. I don't need to put them in if I don't want to. And that again is another thing designing for flexibility is if you know the standard case is just that they need to guess some number between zero and hundred, it's totally fine to leave your min and your max, um, like at some standard value, right? Which is what we have here. So we define the guesses. We have the min, we have the max. And then what I've actually done is I've taken some of the functionality that's in here and I've split it up into separate functions. Now, the concept behind this is that what we want to do is we want to have things that are cohesive, that work together, that are combined in the same class. And then inside of the same class, we want to have operations or methods functions, right? That do a specific task be separated and grouped out so that if something goes wrong or we need to change one aspect of the code, it's very easy to do so as opposed to here where everything's in one kind of mainline program. And if we want to change anything, we will likely have to modify the entire thing. So let's just have a look at here. So we have defined get guess. So what get guess does is gets a guess from a user. Now notice back here, what we did to get the guess was these few lines of code here. That's totally fine. But again, now if we want to change this, we need to change all of this code to do something else. So here kind of the, you know, uh, complement, I guess, if you want to say that is this, we have a method. What it does is it gets the guess from the user. So it says guess equals input. Please guess a number between notice. This is not a hard coded value, the minimum and the maximum. Then what we do is we save self dot valid guess then return int guess. And guess what? This is a method here. And by doing this, what we've actually done is made this a lot more readable for ourselves. So I can read through this method and understand exactly what it does because I've split up some functionality into another method. So I can read through this, understand that self dot valid guess. What is that doing? Exactly what it says, determining if this is a valid guess. If it is, we'll return the integer for the guess. Otherwise, we'll ask them to enter a valid number again, and then we will just recursively call this same method to get that number. Now, if we go down here to valid guess, we can see that all of this does is make sure that the number that we put in is actually an integer and that it's in the correct range. So we can see that here, we're checking that in valid guess. And then if we go down to play, we can see that play actually implements playing this game. 
And then to actually create the game, we have game equals guest number game.play. So hopefully you can appreciate the difference between this code here and why this might be better than this code. Because if we go back to the examples, the things that were wrong with this code, right? We were saying, well, we have this constant value that's in, that's no good. We fix that here by allowing our user to simply enter a constant value when we want to create a new guest number game, right? And then we had some other issues with this as well. Like we need to change the range potentially here. That range is handled for us. We already have that inside an F string. We enter the minimum and maximum range when we create this game. And then anything else that was wrong with this? Well, if we wanted to reuse this, we couldn't. But here now what I can do to use this is simply copy this, change this number to say 75. And now we have two games of guest number and we can use this as many times as we want, wherever we want by simply using two lines of code. Sweet. So that is kind of the idea behind this. And notice that I've separated things out into functions or methods. And these methods do one thing and they do one thing very well. A common mistake that I see quite often is what people will do is rather than kind of separating these things out into three different functions that are all good at what they do is they'll write one mega function. And one mega function is something like this, right? You define like a, you know, play so you could define play and instead of writing all of these separate kind of cohesive blocks that make sense what they do is they would just take all of this code right that we have here and just paste it inside of this one method and have everything happen inside of here now again the problem with that is especially when you're writing larger programs is that when you run into any bug it's very difficult to determine where that bug was because all that code is in the same area but if you split these code this code up into different functions and methods what you can do is you can test each method individually make sure that that method is functioning and then as soon as you get to a method that's not functioning it's very easy to determine what the problem is you can write cohesive small functions or, or methods that do one thing and do one thing very well. That's kind of the standard design principle. Uh, I think it's called something of separation. Then that's going to help you tremendously. And even just reading through this, we understand we have a get guess. We know what that does. We have a valid number. We can understand what that does. And then we have play. We understand what that does. And we don't even need to call play if we don't want to until maybe later on in the code. So we could initialize the game, have it set up and ready to go. And then when we need to play, we could play right and we could implement this into a program where we ask the user would you like to play they say yes boom we go ahead and we start playing so the design principles here again that i need you to really nail in is that we need to separate things out into functions or methods that do one thing and they do one thing very well and it's quite common that what we want to do is make sure our methods or functions do not have side effects. And what I mean by side effects is that they modify some value or they make a bunch of changes or they call a bunch of other methods if that's not necessary. The reason for that, again, is because you want these functions to do one thing and do one thing very well. And if they can do that, it makes your life a lot easier. Again, notice just in the play here, I was able to clean this code up quite a bit because now instead of having to implement all this stuff to get the guess, I can simply call the method self.getGuess. This one can use the method valid number right? These things work well for the one task that they can achieve. And if I needed to reuse them later on to check if a number was valid for some other purpose, it'd be quite easy to do that. And then here we implement these few lines of code. Everything's very clean, easy to read. And this is what you define as good, clean code. All right. So that has been it for this design. Now we're going to move into example three, where we start talking about packages, modules, and namespaces in Python, which are going to allow you to organize your code even more. So I hope this is making sense. I hope I'm giving you a few design principles and things to think about. And again, that's the idea behind this whole tutorial is to get you thinking like a proper programmer, get you thinking about your design and how you want to actually make things. And a good idea is to always think about these things before you actually go ahead and start programming. Okay. So what I have here is a math functions um, kind of module, right? So I've said math functions dot pi. And the idea here is that I would like to use some of the functions that are inside of here in this script test.py. So we'll talk about how we could do that in a second, but let's just have a look at this module. It's fairly long, you know, it's 64 lines and has a few different functions that seem to do different things or act on different objects. So first of all, we have these list functions that I've denoted here. These all act on a list. We have get max, get min, get average and get median. Clearly some operations just to test, you know, those specific things from a list. Then we have some hash table functions. What I mean by hash table is simply dictionary. And here we have get keys, hash key or has key, sorry, max value, min value, right? So we have all these different functions, but they're all in one module or one block. 
So right now, if I want to use these, what I have to do is import this math functions um, uh, module, right? So if I import math functions, because I'm in the same folder here, example three, I should have access to all of these different functions. So that's fine. Let's see how we can actually use that. So let's print math functions dot get average. And then here, let's pass a list. Let's go one, four, five, eight, whatever, some random stuff. So let's print that. If we run this here and we look up, we get 5.66667 as our average. So that's how we use that. Now, what if we want to use one of those hash table functions? So if we make a hash table here, we'll say ht equals, and let's just do hi one uh, Tim. If we can get this in here six and let's call one of those hash table functions now. So instead of get average, let's do um, get max. I think get max is the correct one. Let's see or max value, I believe is what it is actually. So max value and then in here we pass HT and we'll see that we get the value of six. So this is fine. We have these math functions all in this one module. But can you think of what might be wrong with what I've done here or why this might not be the best thing? So think back to that property that I talked about of cohesiveness. We want things that are similar to be in similar areas, right? So if we go back to example two and we look at this, everything that pertains to guessing a number is stored inside of this guessing number class, right? We have those three different methods. So get guess valid number and play, which are all pertaining to our, you know, in the same context as guessing a number. We have the attributes that are uh, involved in guessing a number stored in this class. And then this play method, you know, uses the appropriate methods. It's all cohesive, right? Whereas get guess, all the things that are involved in getting a guess are in this one function or in this one, uh, what do you call it? Method, right? Cohesive. That's what we call it. This in math functions, I would not call cohesive. And the reason for that is because we have two different purposes for this module, one for hash table functions and one for list functions. Yes, these are all utility functions. That's fine. We could call it that. But what I want to show you is how we can separate these out into separate modules that make this a little bit more clear. So let's go ahead and let's make two new files in here and let's call the first one uh, HT functions. So for hash table functions .py. and let's make our next one. So new file called uh, what was the other one list underscore functions. Now these are not the best names in the world, but hopefully uh, you're getting the point here. And what we're going to do is just take all of these list functions that we had and put them inside of list functions. And we'll take all the hash table functions that we have and put them inside of hash table functions. So here I'm going to show you how we can import these properly. So don't worry about that for now. But now we have two cohesive modules. So we have the module HT functions, which has an appropriate name that stores all of the functions related to hash tables. And we have a module called list functions that stores all of the uh, functions related to lists, right? So these are now cohesive. And if I was say looking at this program a year later and I wanted to figure out, oh, there's something wrong with a list function, I would very easily be able to find that because I know that it should be in the module list functions. Again, this is organizing. This is kind of setting up for the future and thinking if I was going to add more functions, do I want to add them into this huge script called math functions or do I want to separate things out into separate modules that make sense? So right now that's what we've done. We've separated them out. So to use these now, instead of just importing math functions, we're going to import HT underscore functions and we'll import, uh, let's do a separate line list underscore functions as well. So now if we want to use this instead of math functions, we have to say HT underscore functions like that and run this code. And we see that we get the same answer of six. So now say we only wanted the list functions. We don't need to implement or import all of the hash table functions as well. In fact, we can just remove that line or comment it out and we just get the list functions. Great. So this is splitting things up. This is working well. And now I'm just going to show you what happens if uh, we do something that's quite common, which is name methods the same or name modules the same uh, that are inside both things here. So are inside both modules. So HT functions, list functions. So here notice in list functions, I have get max, get min, get average, get median. And then here I have get keys, has key, max value, min value. Ideally, when we're creating something like this, we want our naming to be consistent so that it's intuitive enough that if I had to guess what a specific uh, function was doing or guess a function name, I could do so. So if I knew, you know, list functions was named with get prefixes, I would hope that this one would be get, uh, named with get prefixes as well, so that it would be easier for me to, uh, you know, guess or understand what is happening. So what I'm actually going to do is go ahead and change these names to say instead of max value, get max like that. And here we'll say get min. 
Now we'll leave the has key because that kind of makes sense to be named what it is. Uh, but get keys, get max and get min, let's name them the same and notice that now we have duplicates. So get max and get min. Okay, so I've named both of the functions in here the same thing. So get min and get max is now named the same as get min and get max. And what I want to do is show you what happens when we actually import the specific functions from these modules. So I haven't showed you yet how to do this, but we can import HT functions, which is going to be the module here, right? But if I want to actually not have to do something like HT underscore functions dot, then what I can do is import the specific function itself. So I can actually say from HT underscore functions, import get max, and I can import get min as well if I wanted to. And then we'll do the same thing from list functions with those same names. So we'll import get max and get min as well. And I want to show you what happens when I actually do get max of HT. So in theory, this should work, right? Because we've imported get max. We know that we have a function that works in HT functions that's called get max. So let's see what happens when we call get max on HT. We run that and we actually run into a problem. And it says that uh, string and float cannot be, uh, there's, there's a type error, right? Something's wrong. Now, the reason for that is because look what module it's actually running in. It's running in list functions. So a lot of people probably would have guessed this, but what happens is when you import methods that have the same name, or functions that have the same name from different modules, the most recent import is what's used. So in this case, get max and get min are going to be used from list functions instead of HT functions, because in the namespace is what it's called for this program, there was two versions. So it took the most recent version and used that. So if I wanted to explicitly use the um, hash table one, right, instead of the list one, I would have to do HT functions, but I can't even do that right now until I decide to go here and import ht underscore functions. This is kind of weird, but you need to actually import explicitly the module if you're going to use it like this. So with the dot operator, and if you import these names, right, so get max, get min, you have to make sure they're not going to be named the same as something else, or you can fix this using what's called an alias. So what I'm actually going to do is say, okay, well, I want to import it like this. I want to import the function itself, but I want to fix this naming collision. So what I'm actually going to do is I'm going to import get max as ht underscore get max. Now what this does is it's called an alias. It simply renames this get max to ht get max in this scope. So in the, this file scope, this means now if I want to use ht get max, um, I, or if I want to use get max from ht functions, I use ht get max. So to do that, I'm going to say ht underscore get max and run this and notice that there's no issue that works fine. So we can use this as to what's called alias something. We can also say import ht uh, underscore functions as say h, right? And now if we wanted to use something specifically from there, so we say, you know, h dot get keys from hash table. Notice that we get the dictionary keys hi and Tim and that works fine. Okay, so that's kind of the basics on importing modules and using modules and to separate things into cohesive kind of blocks. But what I'm going to do now is show you how we can actually create something called packages. So notice that since list functions and HT functions are kind of similar, right? They kind of do a similar thing. They both work for functions. What we can actually do is separate these into what we call a package and use a package. Now, what a package is, is essentially just a folder full of Python modules. Now, to make a package, you have to make a new folder. So we'll make a new folder first. I'm going to call this, uh, let's just call this the functions package. Or actually, let's call it util because it's going to be like utility things for our program. So we'll call it util like that. And what I'm going to do is drag in ht function. So I don't think I can drag it, but I think I can move it into example three uh, util slash ht functions. Okay, and let's move this one in as well. So move into if I can get this off my screen, Ugh, it's just being annoying. All right, so let's move this into util like that. So now they're both inside of util. Now, all I have to do if I actually want to make this folder, what's called a package, which means I can import the package. So the entire folder rather than the specific modules is I have to put a new file in here and I have to call it a knit. So underscore, underscore, knit, underscore, underscore dot pi. Now, what that does is pretty much just tell Python 
that, hey, we're initializing this package. This is a Python package, which means rather than having to import HT functions and list functions separately, I can actually import them both at the same time by simply importing this package. So I'll show you how that works now. So I guess we don't need math functions anymore. But if we go to test.py, rather than having to do something like this, so from HT functions, from list functions, what I can actually do is import. And in this case, I can import util. Now importing util will actually let me have access to this HT functions and this list functions. So now essentially what I've done is I've created a folder that is cohesive. And the reason it's cohesive is because it contains two modules, right? These two modules are similar. They both act on functions. And then I have two modules inside of this folder and these modules, right? Have functions inside of them that are cohesive, that are similar. They both act on hash tables or they act on lists, right? And then these functions themselves do one thing and do one thing very well. They're not doing this huge amount of things. So my program or my whatever you want to call it project is cohesive, which is what we wanted to get to. We wanted to organize things so that they make sense where they are. So we have that now. So how do I use util? So to import a package, you can simply import it like this, but there is some kind of tricky things um, in terms of how this works. So since this is a package, you can just import the name. But if I want to actually use the modules that are inside of it, what I have to do is say something like this. So from util, and you've probably actually seen this before. So from util import, and then we'll do the name of those um, files that we want. So we'll import ht functions and we'll import in this case list underscore functions. Now you might say, well, what was the point of that? That seems like if anything, you just made it more complicated from before. Well, the point of that was to organize things well in my program so that I now have functions that are kind of grouped together and modules that are grouped together inside of the same folder. So now if I wanted to say, if I had a larger project with a bunch of files, it'd be very easy for me to find where my utility functions are because they're in the util package. And then inside that package, I have modules that are organized correctly, which means I can find what I need to find. So we'll import HT functions and we'll import list functions. And now we can use them like we would before. So I can say HT functions dot get keys and use that. That works totally fine. Nothing wrong with that. And if I wanted to alias these, what I could do is simply say import HT functions as HT and then do the same import here. So from util import list functions as LS, right? And then if I wanted to use a list function, I could say LS dot get max, right? And I can say LX dot get max of one, four, five, like that. And my HT max will still work. So I can say print HT dot get underscore max of and here we'll just put actually the hash table like that. And what is the issue here? Oh, I've called this HT one HT is what that is called. So let's just make this H instead of HT. So that was an issue there and do that and we see that this works fine so that has been packages modules and the hierarchy kind of goes package module and then classes methods functions and then you have everything else right which just attributes or regular lines of code so this is the way that you can organize and separate your code out so that it's easier to find and to tweak later and remember every time you're programming what you want to be thinking about is okay how can i make this as simple for myself as possible how can I make it so that when I look back at this in two years, if I need to change a file, I can do that because everything's organized and clear. And hopefully this kind of video, I know there's a lot of repetitive stuff in it, really drilled that into your head. And I know that this probably was a lot for, um, for some people. There was a lot of things shown here, but the idea is to make things cohesive. And that's the introduction to software design. There's a lot more to talk about. And I am planning on doing some more videos in this domain, but if you want to read up more on this, again, there is that book in the description that has so much more detail than what I've provided here. This was just to give you some examples, get you thinking about how software design actually works, why software design is important and showing you some of the tools like creating packages and modules in Python that allow you to separate out your code. And to, again, to make that package, you simply make a folder called init.py. This folder is in the same directory as my math functions and my test.py, which means that from either of these files, I can import that entire package and use anything that's inside of it. Obviously, there's a lot more to talk about with packages, but I think that's where I'm going to leave it here. And hopefully this gave you a good introduction to software design. So if you have any questions, do leave them down below. Let me know any series you'd like to see in the future. And if you enjoyed the video, of course, leave a like, subscribe to the channel, and I will see you guys in another YouTube video.